Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Here we are in the temple again. It's grand. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's just good to be here. And uh, so uh, I want, so uh, we've been talking this retreat about the way the universe carries us and the way the more uh, the more we work it out and the more we put it into categories, and the more we make maps, um, the more we notice there's something deeper than that. And that something deeper is pretty much what Zen is about, which is why uh, Zen is kind of hard to explain because the explanations and I <laughs> the explanations are not it. <laughs> so so uh, give me your elevator elevator speech on Zen. You know, that's not it. <laughs> so, uh, and this really came from the uh, Zen is a mashup between of Taoism and, and Buddhism, which is, you know, stranger than it sounds actually. And uh, Taoism is a is a if you look at the uh, I've just been reading a new translation of the Tao Te Ching, which is the way and its virtue, or the way and its power. And uh, Tao Te Ching, and Jing is just book, you know, like I Ching. So, um, and thinking about the, this, and it's a very strange book, the Tao Te Ching, because it, um, uh, it's been it's amazingly popular. It's been translated. The only book that's been translated more than it is, is the Bible. And it's been translated into more languages than the Bible, and it's been translated almost as many times as the Bible. And there's a joke among people who, you know, interested in Chinese that you can tell someone's getting ready to retire because they tell you that they're doing another translation of the Tao Te Ching. There's already thousands of them. <laughs> And there are translations into Klingon and so forth. So, so <laughs> they're very important. Yeah. So, um, and it's kind of a mysterious book because it doesn't really make sense. And and so it and whereas Buddhism, primeval Buddhism, was set out with you know six thises and seven thats and one hundred eight some things, and it was absolutely matter of like parsing consciousness into these small categories that you could understand. And Taoism really doesn't understand, you know, it says separately, you can't understand things, but lumped together, you can get a general idea. That's Dong Shan said that. And so I'm going to start with, uh, so this is the theme of when we it's the boat without oars, motion, you know, the boat is not motionless, it's drifting down the stream. <laughs> and you look at the riverbank as everything lumped together, it's the, the eternal quality in life, the vastness, uh, all of that. And the way, you know, when you wait, <clears throat> if your mind seems sort of crowded, you don't put something good in it, you just wait and your mind opens. And the vastness comes to help you because you can't you can't sort of make your mind be still. And this was kind of known in Buddhism anyway. The, there's a sutra that goes, uh, don't make delusive thoughts for enough. When there are delusive thoughts, don't get rid of them. Already we're in strange territory there. It's already that's already kind of exciting. And uh, and so uh, and the the Tao Te Ching or Taoism generally, but the Tao Te Ching has a whole lot of categories of 
bright and dark, beautiful and beautiful and ugly, uh, even uh, healthy and crippled, masculine and feminine, and all these oppositions. And the culture of the time tend to think one side, like the bright side, the yang side was good, and the other side, not so good, wealthy and poor. And, and so you've got A and B, and then the Tao Te Ching just does a lot of flipping of that. So everybody's expecting something to be good, and the Tao Te Ching flips it. And so, uh, and that itself is not just that, that itself makes you question whether it's something whether you can evaluate whether something's good or bad or whether something's uh, helpful or not to you, or whether you should take the right attitude towards things. And Taoism really doesn't take an attitude towards things, and neither does the Koan, Koan world. Koan world says things like, you know, the emperor says, um, what merit have I gained? And Bodhidharma says, no merit. <laughs> This is to an emperor who's supposed to be, you know, you don't ever say something like that to an emperor. And, um, and, uh, and well, what is the first principle of the holy teaching? And Bodhidharma says, vast emptiness, nothing holy. And uh, even though he was supposed to have just come from India, he's clearly already been touched by whatever that spirit that we're calling trusting the Tao, feeling the way of the Tao, uh, where, in which if you're making an explanation, you've really sort of moved away from things a bit. And you, you'll, you'll find this is just ordinary life is like this. You'll find a friend says, a friend comes with some, I have a friend who's always calling up and <clears throat> saying, they'll be late. <laughs> Which is you know not a surprise by now, and um, but they're my friends, so you know, it's fine. And then they give me an explanation. I object. I don't object to them being ex late. I object to the explanation because <laughs> so like, the lateness is there. I have another person I know who's always saying, "As soon as I do this, then I'll be happy." This is the the Buddhist definition of suffering, and says, "As soon as I, you know, I go to school, or as soon as I get." a better partner as soon as I get I'll be happy and then and somebody just sent me a code saying uh, as soon as they uh, you know uh, uh, their latest version of that and, and my friend said oh well I wish them well and I said so do I but that's not going to make them happy so <laughs> when you say this will make me happy or that will make me happy it won't you know? and so uh, because uh, happiness comes from inside, you know, it doesn't come from out there. It doesn't come from, I do this and then I get happy. So uh, the Lao Tzu, you know, there's a few different, uh, you know, the way that can be named is not the eternal way. This is the famous opening of the Tao Te Ching, which I don't have here. Ah, here I do. <laughs> This is uh, Red Pine, whom some of you have heard, who's, you know, one of the old, he's a guy who lives on an island off Seattle. Well, no, actually, he lives um, in Port Townsend, which is on the peninsula out of Seattle. They well, usually get there by ferry. And he's kind of spent a long, long time in China traveling around. And he looks like, and he's quizzled, he looks like, Chinese hermit, you know, it's kind of fun. Although he's actually from, you know, Oklahoma or somewhere like that. The way that becomes a way is not the immortal way. The name that becomes a name is not the immortal name. The maiden of heaven and earth has no name. The mother of all things has a name. In innocence, we see the beginning in longing, we see the end. Two different names for one and the same. 
one we call dark, the dark beyond dark, the doorway to all beginnings. So when Yun Men says something like, it's dark, it's dark, what if suddenly it's dark? He's talking about something that happens to the mind when we give up our reaching around, we give up our explanations. And, uh, and we, in a way, we fall into the universe and the universe holds us. The, the, that's the first, the sixth verse of the, of the Tao Te Ching. The valley spirit never dies. It's called the mother deep. The gate of the mother deep is the root of, heaven, of earth and sky. Elusive as gossamer, always here unseen. Use it, it will never fail you. And Chinese is such an ambiguous language that there, there are hundreds of different versions of this verse, you know, but uh, it's called the mother deep or it's called the dark womb. Uh, but elusive as gossamer, always here unseen. You know, that's, there's something... I would say that that's what the Chan people called Buddha nature. There's something that is in everything. When if you look at anything and you, you start to look at something without prejudice, you start to realize you're looking at self as something marvelous in it. You, if you question, your question itself has something marvelous in it. Uh, and so that's what Yun Men said, uh, give me a, uh, Forget about the light, give me the reaching. The reaching itself is something marvelous. So, so I want to talk now a bit about, um, so I just want to give you that as a bit of a, I don't know, can't really say that's theory, but it underlies a lot of Zen. And so you'll see in Zen where people are expecting a, a certain move and the Zen teacher does something else which is not that, it's just that we realize all the ways we map come to an end, all the ways we describe and explain ourselves, all the ways we justify ourselves, all the ways we say, I'm important, all the ways we say, I'm not important, or all the ways we say, I'm happy, I'm sad. When we come to the end of those, something vast appears. And, and the other thing I could say is that it's not about not feeling things. I've noticed this, one of the things I think that Zen does, or and Taoism for that matter, does or offers to us that Buddhism doesn't, is that it's not really trying to get away from the heart. And that then the heart starts to blossom and appear. And you'll find that in... in uh, as, you, as the con work deepens, I think, I think I've, we do feel like we get held more. And all you have to do is, um, how do I get there? Don't try to get there. You just stay with your con. You keep company with your con. You hang out with your con. Um, I mean, how do I make my con do what I want it to do? You keep you. It's like saying, "How do I make my friend do what I want them to do?" <laughs> you can't. You don't. That's not. It, you don't need to. It's already helping you. So you have to do as you start returning to your con. You're in the darkness. You're not explaining it. You're not knowing what you're doing. You're not having a twelve-step program or five-step program or a seven-step program. You're. Um, You're just here and you're doing it. And, uh, and you notice that you start to be held and your confidence, your confidence deepens. And, the other, and I might say that it's as if a, one of the old images was a flower is growing inside you. Another was that you're nurturing the spiritual embryo. So that's like a baby is growing. So, uh, but you can't, you can't make things happen with the koan, but they do happen when you really keep company with the koan and you keep turning towards it the way you would with a friend, then it transforms you. 
So you don't transform by knowing what you're trying to do or bring about in yourself. Um, you transform by keeping closer and closer company to the koan. And then the koan does this thing I just spoke about where you say, yes, but it's always this. And the koan says, no, it's not, <laughs> unless it's not, it's not always this. Grief is terrible unless it's beautiful and opens doors like that. Um, and uh, I, sh I need to get away from everything I'm feeling unless everything you're feeling will give you life. So this very heart-mind as Buddha is one of the old, old origins of koan study. This very, uh, your thoughts and feelings are the Buddha. So there's that. And, and the koan I want to give you, I think, do I have it? Here it is. Today, um, I guess I've already given you about five koans, but <laughs> ignore them. <laughs> the kind I want to give you today is um, the famous koan about dark, relying on the darkness. Shusan, uh, a uh, notable ancient teacher, said, if you get it the first time you hear it, you teach the Buddhas and ancestors. If you get it the second time you hear it, you'll teach gods and humans, angels, spirits, humans, whoever. If you don't get it until the third time you hear it, you won't even be able to save yourself. So just to stop here, when you, uh, when you hear that for the first time, you think, well, if you get it the first, first time you hear it, then you'll be terrific. If you get it the second time you hear it, it's pretty good. The third time you hear it, you're doomed. You still don't get it. But what if I've already heard it four times and I don't get it? So, so this is called comparing mind <laughs> naturally arises. You can't help it. It's there. So, oh, my God. <laughs> and um, I was five years on the con. You know, I didn't get it the first time I heard it and that kind of thing. So it's rather fun. So he's clearly having fun with everyone. And, and you can tell how hard that comparing mind is when it arises. Oh, God, what I'm doomed, you know. I'm listening to this great teacher. He says, I'm supposed to, and I've heard, you know, I've been with this great teacher for months or years. And he says, I'm supposed to have gotten at least by the second time I heard. <laughs> and so he says, and then this, person says this great thing out of the audience his voice comes as something comes out of the universe you know like the voice of a a crow or an owl and so or a training whistle and he says when did you get it teacher and uh shushan said the moon sets at midnight i walk alone through the town um, and you can tell, oh, something that opens out in the darkness of, I didn't get it, I can't get it, but scrabbling and reaching for it. And you can, perhaps you can feel that in the mind that wants to impress like that. Um, and, uh, and then suddenly, when you stop all the reaching, you're back where everything begins. And that's the original face of things. Before the reasons began, you know, before the Milky Way was invented, all that stuff. And there's a tremendous peace. And so right now, the moon has set. We're in a world and you're walking through the village, you know, everything is quiet, everyone's in, asleep. It's moon set at midnight, so it's after midnight, you're walking through the dark. What's it feel? What's it like? What's it like to be the person? Just feel it, you know, walking in the dark. And uh, you can tell Shu San doesn't think you need a light here. So it's like young men. There's no sun, no moon, no light. How will you get hold of something? And in your life, if you don't know where to go, where to turn, what to do next, 
The moon has set at midnight. I walk alone through the town. And uh, there's such a, a wonderful, um, there's a lot of stuff about if you're really alone, you're really accompanying, accompanying the universe and accompanied by the universe. Because you're not, uh, you're not ranking yourself, you're not comparing yourself, you're not getting it the first time, the second time, the third time, then you're alone. And uh, the, um, it's kind of hard to get that in a way, but it's sort of, you can see how much we suffer when we are comparing and grasping. When I was first in, uh, I, 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 I kind of thought I was a hard case, so I got into, um, I went into a training, training periods and lived in a temple for a while, a couple of years actually. And um, uh, and then the first time I was there, I'd come from Australia, and, and there were kind of interesting people associated with that temple. There were a lot of smart people and several Pulitzer Prize-winning poets and people like that, and uh, along with people like me and Doug Growers, and <laughs> this is in Hawaii, and uh, uh, and um, surfers and people. So, but it was an interesting place. And uh, the Roshi would invite the prominent people to dinner and would go to dinner on Saturday night. And um, I don't know what they talked about, but some of, one of the poets was a person I'd read, really. I remember carrying his poems around when I was through the jungles in New Guinea when I was really young, you know, and uh, never thought I'd meet him. And there he is, you know, running to Doksan with me and the Zendo. But, and, but he always got to go to um, dinner with the Roshi. And at first I had the film, there was a lot of talk about, I'd like to go to dinner with the Roshi. <laughs> and at some stage I thought, I'm not here for that. You know, I'm here, I'm here to wake up really into what is the true matter of life. And 